Walter White isn't the only guy cooking meth. Sometimes your tenants are. That's the topic of today's show. Let's dive in. Hey, real estate investors, welcome to another episode of the Tenants from Hell show here on Holton Wise TV. As always, I'm your host, James Wise. Behind the scenes, we got my man Tommy cutting up the footage. Today's show is pretty epic. We had the pleasure of sitting down with Brandon from the ultra popular YouTube channel Investment Joy. We spoke to Brandon about a meth lab that he had to deal with. Let's take a look at the footage. All right. So, Brandon, man, you freaking came out of nowhere recently, dude. Your YouTube channel investment joy it's like you're just like you were a dude who just uh collected quarters out of laundry mats and then now you're this youtube sensation you have this huge rental portfolio apparently and uh i wanted to have you on so we could talk about some of your savage stories because you seem to be the only guy out there on the internet that has stories as bad if not worse than my tenants from hell stories i i think that i think that the big issue or the big thing is Oh, most of the bigger landlords I run into, they've all got the same stories. And I've got guys that have worse stories than I do, but they never talk about it unless you're in like a private meeting. But, you know, I'm throwing all my stuff on YouTube anymore. And it's a situation where I'm talking about my stories. And it's like I talk to people, you know, in my local RIA and, and just did my day to day adventures. And they all have similar stories. And I just don't understand why your average person has not hold, heard them before. Because I've talked to people in casual conversation about things that I deal with, and they just cannot believe, and they can't believe it exists. And I, I've told them, you know, this is a standard day-to-day thing. 90% of the time when I have an eviction, they do not leave the house clean. Something really screwed up happens. So, Yeah, dude, I feel you. Uh, that's actually why I created the Tenants from Hell show, because this type of stuff is just happening over and over and over, and we... We just couldn't believe that uh, the general public was just so shocked or so confused yeah. by this. Like constantly, you know, whenever we would evict a tenant, uh, you know, coming from the industry, right? We understand when we evict a tenant, you know, they've stiffed us on rent. We've gone through court proceedings. It's been months. They've known this is coming. But then the general public, uh, you know, has the viewpoint that the landlord is the bad guy. You yeah. know, they vilify the landlord. So that's that's what led me to creating this show. And I really wanted to have you on because, like I said, man, I, I love your content that you got on Investment Joy. I think it's cool, the laundromat stuff, and then you've transitioned into real estate. Actually, yeah. some of me and you have in common, dude. I actually own a laundromat too. Oh, really? Uh, cool. Unlike you, though, I have not opened mine yet. I bought it no. attached to a sex motel. We bought this uh, 40,000 square foot motel laundromat combo, and we shut everything oh down to convert to apartments and I haven't gone yeah. through the process of actually starting the laundromat back up. And after yeah. I watch your videos, I don't know if I want to anymore. <laughs> it is what it is. You could, you could do well with a laundromat. You can do awful with a laundromat. I, I picked these laundromats up pretty cheap and there was a reason why it's because the last guy that had them did terrible. So, you know, um, yeah, good stuff. Mine's like in a, a distressed area too. So if any of you guys out there watching this want to watch Brandon, uh, you know, run a laundromat, you know, we'll link to some of that stuff below. But what I really want to get into right now, though, dude, is why I have you on the show. Let's talk about some tennis from hell, man. Let's talk about some nasty stories. You and I privately were talking about uh, a house that you had that ended up being a meth house. Can you walk yes. us through that? Sure. Okay. It starts off, uh, I'm thinking 2014, my brother, he has um, a guy start to help him out at my brother's warehouse, doing repair, putting up some framing inside the warehouse. The guy is part of a local church recovery program. He's been in the re recovery program, I'm guessing between six and nine months. They were homeless. Um, I wasn't aware that there was a drug issue, uh, but... Um, but there was one <laughs> and I was kept in the dark of that. And they said, look, this guy has a kind of iffy past. 
you know, we want you to look past it. He and his wife and his kids have been doing real well the past six, nine months-ish. Um, they're doing well, but they need a place of their own to really flourish. He's been working for your brother. I th and this was 2015, so 2014, late 2014, early 2015. I said, all right, you know, I'm willing to consider this. Um, let's do it. And, you know, this was after I'd been a, only a full-time landlord for a couple of years. I thought, ah, you know, I'm doing pretty well in my rental business. So I'll, I'll, I'll give these guys a chance. Uh, they moved into one very nice three bed, one bath, a uh, downtown, gorgeous turn of the century place. One of my most favorite properties. They move in and, you know, the problems start almost immediately. Um, different landlords, they have different processes and systems they set up. And at that time, I was not very good on my, what does it put, as a landlord, how do you uh, get your tenants to sign up for utilities? As it is now, you don't get the keys till you give me confirmation codes. And this deal is one of the reasons why. Um, so I had electric, water, trash, um, gas all in my name. Um, month later, I get a nice fat bill in the mail um, for that tenant for, I don't know how much in electricity. Um, and I go to the tenant, I say, hey, you need to get this these uh, utilities switched into your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Brandon, we'll get them switched. Um, go back, month number two. Hey, um, you're paying your rent, which I appreciate, but um, here now we're up to $500 in just electric bills. Um, this all, is, all in one month? Uh, this is now month number two. Okay, so he didn't pay month one and this, one, we got it. So 250 a month, which is still a lot of money. I call a local um, attorney saying, hey, I, I need to get, what do I do here? They're paying rent, but they're not paying their electric bill. I, I got to terminate it. And the, I got wonderful advice from this attorney. And she said, well, Brandon, that's considered a self-help eviction. And you can't do anything about it. You just have to keep the electric in your name. <laughs> Which <laughs> I was like, oh, this isn't good. And then month number three or month number four, I say, you know, I'm going to have to, they stop paying their rent now. Um, and I'm getting complaints from neighbors. Neighbors are actually tracking down my personal phone number and the properties in an LLC. So they actually did their homework. Um, they did their homework to find my name and number knowing that I'm got, a, got the property in an LLC. And they call me and they say, hey, Brandon, we're pretty sure that these people are also selling drugs out of your place. So um, I actually have a sit down meeting with the tenants and say, hey, look, you're stiffing me on utilities. This is month number four. You're, you've stiffed me on utilities for about $2,000. Um, we're at the four, fourth month. You haven't paid your rent. The rent was only six, $600 a month for a gorgeous three bed, one bath. And I said, Hey, look, you're stiffing me on rent. Now I'm in the hole two grand on all these utilities. And, and they say, and I said, you, you my, people are calling me and saying that there are people going inside of your house, possibly selling drugs. And the guy stands up and is like, well, what do you, who, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do with my house? And I said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's not your house. Cause I'm, you, you're not even paying your rent. And I said, the people that I hear that are in or your house are dealers. And I said, this is a bad situation. You've got a child here that's involved. You've got a wife that's involved. I'm trying to be the really nice guy here. And the, you know, he goes up and he says, here, I, I, you know, I was in drug recovery for a year. You don't need to be worrying about this. I'm just trying to help people. People helped me get clean, and now I'm helping people get clean, and you're a monster, Brandon. I'm like, oh, gosh, you know. So I go through, I, um, this is month number four, month number five, um, or month number four, I file for eviction. Um, down here, you guys are, are a, a bit up north for me. Down here, it uh, takes about three weeks to get your court case um, scheduled. Um, you win the court case, then it's another 10-ish days for the set out. So it's about a month afterward. I'm at five months now. Um, no utilities paid back to me. Um, I'm now two months-ish of lost rent. The, um, we go in with the bailiff. Uh, we win the court case. They never show up to the court. Uh, for the municipal, they, they never here. do. They very rarely ever show up. Oh, but it depends on how many tenant tenant hell stories you want. I got one guy that brought thirteen people as witnesses against me in one one other court case. 
Well, I think so, we're going to have to get into that one after this okay, one. We can get that one later. I just, I just posted a video kind of about that on YouTube. And um, uh, if we'll go into that later if you want to, because I've had a lot of people ask me to break that eviction down. So, sure, absolutely. Bring them on. So, okay. so with the, this deal, um, I win the case. They never show up to court. The bailiff, this is probably my second or third eviction ever. I show up and the bailiff, really, really nice older gentleman. He's been doing evictions for 30 years down here. He is so freaking cool. And I don't know if you've ever had time to s spend time with like a bailiff that all they do is evictions. They are so amazing to talk to. They've got, they've got more stories than I do. But um, so I'm sitting there talking to this bailiff and he's got this weird look on his face. I said, something's wrong, isn't it? And he says, something is very wrong. And I said, what's going on? And they said, well, your, your tenants are over here. And he said, we've got a carload of people over here trying to get in your property. And I said, huh? I but like, oh, you know, what's that supposed to mean? I don't know. What are you talking about? What's, what's going on here? And he, he gets on his phone and he says, I need backup. I need some more police here. Maybe the fire department. And I'm sitting there thinking, what on earth's going out? And he says, Brandon, you stand right over here and prevent entry from your, to the property. And so I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm along for the ride. Are, are you and armed I, at this point? Do you have a gun I, on you? I, I can't remember if I have my Glock on me or not. Okay. I probably did. Um, so I, um, so I'm standing there and there's a uh, big fellow <laughs> in a car and he's sitting there going, and this bailiff walks inside, then he pulls out. He, he's in the back of the place. He pulls out, and everybody's gone. And then the bailiff comes down and holding a backpack, and it was like a little My Little Pony backpack. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, found it. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I found it. <laughs> I said, you, I'm an idiot. I don't know what you're talking about. What did you find? He said, meth lab. I, huh? And he's he, he showing me this My Little Pony. He pulls it open, and it's full of Coleman Lanterns fuel bunch of cell phone batteries, pipe cutters, the stuff. And I said, oh, he said, this is mobile meth lab, Brandon. The police and the fire department are on their way. So I've got pictures of when the police rolled up on my Instagram. This is from 015. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be a real fun thing. The police come and they have this whole deal because we are one of the very few municipalities within the state of Ohio that um, requires an actual inspection um I inspection if you have a suspected meth lab I'll, um you're you guys are in cleveland yeah and um to be honest with you we've we've been through everything under the sun except for a meth lab which is why i really wanted to to hear your story on this because that so, is the one uh you know people blowing their brains out killing each other you know all that jazz we've had it all but never a meth yeah. lab so i would love to hear yeah. exactly what so, you do afterwards there's a municipality in Cuyahoga County, and then there's four or five other cities in the United States that essentially have this deal where you have to have a EPA certified meth lab inspection or meth remediation inspection. And you get on EPA's website, that isn't a thing. Um, so I had to go call the city inspector a couple different places. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy to use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. You can manage work orders and even accept them online from your tenants. You can also share work order details with tenants or owners if you wish. With Rent Tech Direct, you will also fill your vacancies faster than ever with the built-in marketing tools. Just enter the details of your property and Rent Tech will automatically provide you with a professional online website as well as syndicate them to popular websites such as Zillow, Trulia, and Apartments.com to get your listing maximum exposure so it's rented fast. We go through and I call all these people. I get a different attorney to help me and say, hey, look, what am I supposed to do here? And they took me aside. They said, really, Brandon, no one knows what you to do because you're the only landlord in the entire county that has actually called the building department about a meth lab. And they said, yeah, it happens, but no one's ever really actually called to ask what to do. So they're looking through the city books and the laws and all this, just all this insane stuff. 
and they say, hey, look, um, we think that you're supposed to call a certified company for meth lab remediation and have them inspect the place. And I say, well, that isn't a thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's not an EPA certificate for meth lab remediation. Um, I said, but I can call an environmental specialist. Yeah, yeah, Brandon, that, that, that's what we mean. And so, you know, I'm thinking, I'm really having, I'm really getting my guts busted out on me because I'm trying to do the right thing. And so long story short, I find a guy and he does uh, swabs. And the deal was you swab each room in four different positions, floors, two walls, or any accessories like a furnace or whatever, and then the ceiling. And two rooms in the house come back for uh, methamphetamine residue and some of the precursor chemicals that are potentially utilized within with meth production. Um, one's a bedroom and the numbers are like really low, but it's right above the uh, whatever they have defined as the limit or the thing for um, meth. Then in the kitchen, it comes back really high. And one of the places they tested was the sink. The sink comes back hot for meth. So, um, was it three weeks and six thousand dollars later i have a clean bill of health from this place the health department is treating me nice now well can you, can you uh hold on real quick i don't want to jump that far ahead okay. how did you get the clean bill of health exactly what okay. did you have to do i found that there is a place um that they there's their meth remediation specialists and one of them is i want to say it's surf pro they've actually got this meth lab package and it's 25k and i called him i said this does not make sense whatsoever um and then i called this other guy who incidentally he's a real nice guy but he's also the guy that helped the city write the um meth lab ordinance so if you get my drift, it's, here's the guy that wrote the law. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, what is it? And he said, it's going to be sixth grade, Brandon. I said, that's just what it is? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Um, so they go in and they they swab. Um, they go in, they swab the walls. They get these essentially kits off Amazon.com. They send them into a lab like in Oregon. And I want to say there's only two or three places in the U.S. that will test for those chemicals. And then they test the um, percentage or the parts per million that come back in that swab. They have a chain of custody they have to sign or whatever, showing that no one else handled the meth swab and stuff like that. Then when they um, go in and test the amounts, they figure out how much, what, do, what needs to be done. And in this case, everything in the house was in the range to where you can fix it. It can be fixed. You don't have to tear the house down or tear, cut in the drywall or whatever. It can be washed down. And essentially, like with meth, you have a group of bases and a group of acids. And they, there's this calculation or something they do, and they essentially wash the walls down with this really nasty stuff. And they just continuously wash the walls down. They vacuum it up. They have a HEPA, uh, giant air handler HEPA filter type deal pulling all the air out of the house constantly, pulling new air in. They have the um, Breaking Bad style Tyvek suits with respirators and all this stuff. And they essentially swab the place down to where any of the substance is neutralized in the walls, floors. It was really clean. That was nice after it was all said and done. So they just essentially mopped it down with these chemicals for a day straight. And then um, they did that in the upstairs bedroom, too, where they also found the lower elevated, but still beyond the um, requirement for meth remediation of this local municipality. And um, I got a giant bill in the mail. We had a nice letter from the city saying, you're clean now. You, we approve you that you can rent this place out again. They gave me their clean bill of how health after spending all this money on it not from my understanding not every municipality like if this house was five miles in any direction um i would not have been liable for anything as far as meth lab remediation goes um essentially could have done it myself with stuff off amazon 
Um, but with the way they wrote the law, I did not want to get in trouble with it. And now there's other meth labs to where you go in the full chemical glass set, beakers everywhere. But essentially, this was close to like a shake and bake lab. Essentially, no glassware involved. It was a backpack full of stuff um, that most people could probably get from Walmart and a hardware store and a couple places like that. Very, very flammable. And I'm glad the house didn't burn down. So that's cool. But you know, it was a very, very expensive thing. Long story short, I asked the police, please, please do something about this guy. He has a little kid living in this, you know, a little nine-year-old girl, and they're cooking meth in the kitchen. And CPS does nothing. The, the, the wife says she's going to leave the husband. She does for, I think, a full three months. They get back together. He's arrested two more times for drugs. Um, I've mentioned in a couple of my YouTube videos, I actually own a newspaper, um, a, a digital media firm here in Central Southern Ohio. We actually, um, FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act, a um, officer cams from a recent arrest involving this guy. He got tasered. Uh, <laughs> they put more meth on him. And then, um, uh, I don't know if you guys up there get uh, state AG, uh, attorney general news, but there was this big attorney general deal, you know, operation, blah, 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 catches 50 drug dealers in central Southern Ohio. And this guy was up near the top echelon of drug dealing in central and Southern Ohio. And he will likely never see the light of day. And this is something that happened, I want to say two or three weeks ago. And, you know, we are now for over four, almost five years. This was, Jan I think this whole thing culminated uh, January, 2015 with me as far as the meth lab eviction bailiff deal. And this guy two or three weeks ago got busted by the state attorney general, Ohio State Patrol, multiple sheriff's departments, undercover informants, and just on and on and on and on. It's insane. Well, I got to... <clears throat> That's that's a lot to digest. Sorry. <laughs> I got a few a few questions. I was just trying to jot some of them down. Um, the the first question is: You said you're about five years removed from it. Uh, yes. Do you have any? Because again, I've never been through a meth lab. Do you have any uh, disclosure requirements? Do you have to disclose to every single tenant going forward? Like since the, then, that it was at one see, point a meth lab. The the local municipality um, they say to do it. They say you need to offer disclosures. Well, the immediate question that I have is which disclosure do I offer? Because you know, with lead based paint, we have a federal lead, we have a federal disclosure form that we have and we make them sign off on it. Yeah. I've also got a, uh, it's not, an e maybe it's an EPA deal, but I've also got a radon disclosure. I have people sign when they move into a place. So I went to the local municipality who sets that mandate for the meth lab. And I say, what kind of disclosure do you need? And they say, Oh, well, you know, you need the disclosure. What kind of disclosure? So I've asked the local municipality what disclosure is that, and they can't answer me. So I say, well, then I'm going to make my own form. Well, no, it needs to be official. I'm like, well, is it uh, Southern, Central Southern Ohio official? Do you want my attorney to charge me two fifty an hour to come up with a disclosure? What kind do you do? So we've kind of come up with our own internal disclosure that says, hey, we had um, <coughs> a meth lab here. We had uh, a company come. They've cleaned it up. Everything from what we can tell is a clean bill of health. Here's the clean bill of health. So that's kind of what we've done. But, you know, it's always funny with these kinds of local municipality requirements. They tell you this is what the law says. This is what you need to go do. And then they point at a vague law that uh, no one has a clue on, which is just, I mean, it, it makes me mad as an investor because I spend, I spend more time and effort trying to find the law and figure out what I'm supposed to do than I actually been fixing the problem and trying to figure it out so no, I, I hear you on that one have you gotten like you know over the last five years I'm sure you put a few different tenants in there have you gotten like a lot of tenants that were still nervous about it even though you showed them that you have a the clean first, bill of health the first one was because she worked right next door and uh, saw the the multiple multiple police show up she thought she was worried somebody got murdered there I said no 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 sweetie there's no no one got murdered here. It's just a meth lab. <laughs> <laughs> just I, arguably, I think the meth lab might be a lot worse than the murder. That's that's the other question I had for you. Yours wasn't bad enough to where they had to start cutting out the walls or tearing the house down. I presume yeah. when you were going through this, you got a pretty good education on that process. If oh, it would have been, it. if it would have been worse, 
like what are the, I assume there's more or less like three levels to this, right? There's your level where you can just clean it. I assume yeah. the level after that is you got to cut out the drywall, replace yes. the drywall. And then the worst, the most extreme case would be tearing the house down. Can you kind of walk us through the, the next couple levels? So uh, the part of the education that I got was, you know, there's different things you might have to do. We were able to clean it. And then the second one's, well, you need to start tearing drywall out. And the thing that I've asked these people that do the meth lab remediation, because it sounds an awful lot like lead, lead abatement. I don't know if you've ever done a lead paint abatement on a house, but I've done one right. of those so far. And that was really interesting because we did certain things where there was encapsulation and then others, other was straight removal. And I asked them, I said, uh, I asked somebody kind of recently, this was after the meth lab happened and we had paid for the company to come in. I said, can't, couldn't I just, in the case of a much more severe contamination beyond um, just cleaning, I said, couldn't I do essentially what you do with lead-based paint, do an encapsulation process? And they said, they looked at me really weird and they were I guess so. And I said, because that would be a heck of a lot cheaper, encapsulating the drywall, finding some sort of um, process that could be used rather than just tearing everything out. And they got this really weird look at me and they said, I guess that would be a lot easier, Brandon. And the one of the things that I've had is I, it's very hard for me to get solid answers on these meth lab remediations thankfully oh my gosh thankfully meth is kind of on the way out at least as far as people making it in their bathtub and stuff so i'm hoping that we have fewer of those but um that was kind of one of those those well ask me later brandon uh, you know maybe we can talk about that kind of a situation on your next meth lab i thought oh, <laughs> that's not something i ever want to deal with yeah but it, it, it's also one of those things where you know how many in which situations is carpet and paint and oil-based paint something that would take care of the meth residue after it's been cleaned going through the cleaning process the way that they did it and um proper enca encapsulation with the heavy duty paint like they do with certain kinds of lead-based paint hazards and how many meth lab situations does that remediate and I had this one guy come and, you know, you could see he was really thinking. He said, I think that would probably get 90% of the, the problems. I said, well, you know, is 90% good enough? 95%? Is that good enough for um, a municipality for their testing? And they seemed to agree with me that if you would treat it like some lead contamination type deals to where you clean the property, you tear out all of the immediate surfaces like, um, tearing out carpet and flooring, painting the subflooring, um, in case that even if it does work through. Um, so cleaning, painting, um, cl cleaning out carpet, and then redoing all of that, that, that would solve a very significant amount of the meth problems, even though it is very, very caustic. But you start looking at, you know, I mean, I don't want to go through the whole process of how you make methamphetamine. That's an easy way to get demonetized on Facebook or at least in trouble. But you start, <laughs> you start looking at the base chemicals and the reactions because in our local RIA, we've got a uh, chemical engineer. And, he, and they, we had the police come in to our RIA probably six months ago, and they were talking about how, how to cook meth. We had, a, we had a, a meth cooking course. And the guy that was there that was a chemical engineer, he said, oh, everybody learns this their first year of how you make meth. And I was talking to the police and the chemical engineer. I said, so in order to treat a, a meth lab, you just would have to research all the base chemicals that are used in it, any side chemicals that are affected and figure out just how to kind of remediate that stuff. Because like I said, the, the vast majority of chemicals and components for meth for, to manufacture that stuff are sold at Walmart and Home Depot. That's why it can potentially be very prevalent um, for illegal manufacture of drugs. And for me, sitting down from that perspective, there's not a lot of things that um, Home Depot plus Walmart sells that I could not fix. If, if you know, I, I look at it from that way. So, you know, on one end, I'm really interested if I ever have another meth lab doing the remediation process that I would internally want to do and then comparing it with, you know, what was the official um, municipal requirement for, hey, you know, 
you've got to have this company come in and spend three days with HEPA filters cleaning it out because there's a certain level of their expectations. But then me as a landlord trying to be cost effective, there's a lot more affordable ways they could do it. And what upsets me about the legality of the process was there wasn't too much that was involved in that process that can't be purchased off eBay and Amazon. And what so my question to them was, okay, you know, after it was all said and done, of course, to the mayor of the, the local municipality, I said, all this stuff could be purchased off Amazon and eBay. Um, the information's very hard to find on the EPA, but now I kind of know it. Why, why is it so difficult and why did I spend $6,000? Because I have to recoup that money at some point. Where, where's that, re, re, you know, I'm not going to pay that money out of the pocket. One of my tenants is either through raised rent or delayed upgrades on a property. The money has to come from somewhere. So in that, looking at that, it does not bode me well to spend the big bucks on remediation. What bodes well for me and my tenants and the quality of life for everybody involved is the most cost effective way. And the way that the law's been written is by far not cost effective because their um, suggestion was for me to call SurfPro, put 25000 in their pockets and uh, call it a day. What, what about um, like when it's so bad that they say you just got to tear the house down? Like what kind of meth lab are we talking there? Are we talking like full on Walter White, Breaking yes. Bad, like industrial yes. quantities oh, yeah. here? Yes, with large quantities and essentially, you know, if someone's really good, they'll put in some ventilation and fans to try and handle that, those chemicals. But there's people that have got caught doing that where there's no venting of chemicals whatsoever. And, you know, I said earlier, I guess that's one thing, one of the components that they use is Coleman's lantern fuel, which is a petroleum distillate, very flammable. That's why, you know, you have the adage that meth labs explode because you're using something very flammable. And if you think about uh, your small rinky-dink meth lab, they're kind of doing shake and bake in a small environment, then they're using a flammable product in very limited quantities, you think, well, that sucks. Well, there was a raid that I saw recently, and they had 100 gallons of that stuff, I want to say. And they were going through 100 gallons over you know, some time period, maybe a month, maybe three months. In, if you could imagine accidentally going through your house and spilling a gallon of gasoline, the, the difficulty of fixing that kind of problem, those kinds of problems, I think, are, think, I personally think that's where you end up running into these situations where it's just more cost effective to burn the house down because it would be impossible to figure out where all those contaminations were. So I think, now, I think, think it's the hillbilly version of Walter White. <laughs> now, you know, obviously it was a pain in the ass uh, for you to deal with all that, but because, you know, meth labs are pretty infrequent, right? They don't happen every day and you get investors, a lot of people, everyone has that fear of, oh my God, I got a meth lab. I got to tear my house down. Um, so I'm not trying to minimize how much of a pain in the ass it was for you, but you being the first landlord I've ever actually spoken to one-on-one, uh, -on -one, it seems that you know, the meth lab, even though it's a pain in the ass, it's not as bad as that fear that is out there because it seems yes. like the vast majority of these meth labs can be fixed with either oh, cleaning yeah. or some remediation. Absolutely. And from my understanding, all, all but one meth lab they found in this town has been the smaller variety that can be economically fixed. And, you know, the nice thing is with rentals, you could, to me, and I tell people this, you could always wait your way out of the disaster eventually and we you know we reached that break even point in recent you know in the past where that property had finally paid off the twelve thousand dollar loss you know we're making money on it again it's fine it sucks it was a very very disastrous learning learning situation for me but you know um we've taken care of it and today's a new day uh but once again it was one of those things where if it happens again, which I really don't want it to, I could go in and remediate it in a different way for a lot less. Now, last question I got for you on this, this meth lab. Yes. Um, red flags, right? Tenant, tenant screening, red flags. That's where I want to hit. Absolutely. I made this, I made this video. Um, <laughs> my 10 tenant screening red flags. Guys, if you want to watch that, it's in the show notes below. 
But what I did is I laid out some red flags that tenants, they leave to us when we're, you know, interviewing them to see if we want to place them in the property. And I, I toned in on a red flag. You had said you were feeling good in your business. This is a few years ago. You were feeling good. You wanted to take the risk because you already knew this guy had drug problems in the past. Yeah. You know, we all know now, at least we definitely know it now if we didn't know it then, but we, it sounds like you kind of knew it then too. You just were giving the guy a, a chance yeah. here. We all know that that's a red flag. Is, yeah. Has this situation, has this changed how you screen your tenants and, and what you do when you see these red flags? Yeah, every, every time I, I go through, every time I have an eviction or somebody I lose money on, and I sit down and review their original file that they have, and I say, where did I screw up? Because I don't, I mean, it costs money. This is a $12,000 deal. Not every, you know, not every disaster that I have with an eviction is anywhere close to that, but I want to get better at my job of having rentals. Because like I said earlier, in effect, you know, I do care about the quality of life of my tenants. I care about the quality of life for me and my family. It doesn't do well. It does not help a single human being, whether it's that bad tenant that's trying to get my place to give them a place because it never, you know, when these red flags happen, me giving the guy a house or letting him rent off me did not solve any of his, his issues. It just, it just continued. He continued doing the crap that he's been doing for who knows how long. And so every time I look at it, I try and make my business business more efficient to, to be more profitable because in the long run, it helps even in the short run, even in the short term, it helps my current tenants, my future tenants and my family. And I try to look at all my situations like that because giving somebody the wrong house, somebody that should not be in my rentals, it, it, it's a disaster on every single front. So, you know, the thing that I look, the, the, the policy changes that I implemented there, you know, one, I make them, I make freaking sure they get the utilities in their name before they even move in. Um, number two, I do a much, I have a very, a much longer hold off period. If I see that somebody has drug problems in their past, that is not an automatic no for me at this point in my business. But I go to them or I, I look at their, their um, qualifications and I say, how long has it been since they've had a drug problem? How long has it been? How what much time has elapsed since they had an eviction? And I have certain criteria now and I tell people this up front. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm glad that you're telling me your claim. That's wonderful. I'm glad that you are on the road to recovery. But the road to recovery is a very long process. And I see that you have uh, you've been on the road to recovery for a year. That's nice. So uh, come back to me when um, you've been on the road to recovery for 10 years. And I try to be very upfront with them because, and then it goes into this conversation of, hey, you know, the, this meth lab is not by far not the only drug issue I've had in my rentals. But I look at it and say, you know, what criteria for my screening process do I have to implement so that this stuff happens on a very minimal basis? So I try and be above board with people and say, hey, this is what my requirement is. I can't see any drug charges against you for the last 10 years. And, you know, I, I get cussed at and complained at, but I also tell people, I say, hey, look, if you have had a drug issue on your your record that i can find within the past three years my eviction or my problem rates over 90 percent so and there's not enough money on the face of this planet that i can charge you as a landlord that will satisfy your risk and it's for me as a landlord it's always about mitigating the risk and limiting it and i've i've offered people this deal before i said if i can quantify what your risk profile looks like as a landlord I'll charge you that rent or that deposit and we could go from there. And I've had several people that, you know, they've had these issues. And I said, Hey, um, I'll let you move in the house. It'll be $10,000 deposit. And they get this crazy look at me. And they're like a $10,000 deposit brand. And I said, yeah, because based on your background, based on the things that I know about you from your background check, your um, employment verification, the pay stubs you've submitted to me, the landlord verification checks, all those things. And I've done these things, you know, just as because I, 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 I want to see how can I help people. And I say, you're going to cost me $10,000 right now, I can tell, based <laughs> on my screening process. And some of these people, not many of them, some have been thankful because I, I said to them, I said, this, you're going to cost me money. 
And then I've had other people, you know, they just cuss me out and say, oh, you're, you know, you're a piece of crap, Brandon. And I, I can't believe you'd say that you want $10,000 deposits. Well, hey, you know, my thing is I want to be honest and transparent with every single human being I come across, whether that person that many would consider to be a low life drug addict. I want to be transparent and honest and open with them. And I want to be honest and transparent to investors that I meet. I know a couple guys um, I, I talk to once in a while, they have nine figures in assets. They're in the one to $200 million range worth of real estate investments. I want to give everybody the same story and I want to try, <laughs> I want to try to help people. Um, that's kind of what I want to do on the YouTube channel. And I find that some of these people that I get um, applications from, they're, they're, the other landlords in the area have been uh, not always honest and upfront with them. I had the, I have this one girl that she submits a she submitted an application to me before, and she said, "Well, I want to rent a house off you, Brandon." I said, "Well, I'm sorry, but um, you probably most likely cannot afford to rent off me." And she said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you know, during my um, landlord uh, my research process, I see that you uh, caused six thousand dollars worth of damage for Mister So and So." Um, but he's a landlord here in town. I see, uh, the landlord before him, Mr. You know, Mr. Smith, you did $8,000 worth of damage in their rental. And then the landlord before them, you did $10,000 worth of damage. And as part of my rental process, I would like, you need to make those former landlords whole. And then you need to, um, come up with about $10,000 in a deposit for me. If you want to rent off me. So I just laid out this path and it's going to cost her 50 grand to rent a house again. And she, she, they have this very cool, weird look. And I said, do you realize that the landlords here know that you're, you, you know, we've talked about how much money you've stolen from us. And, you know, like I said, I want to be honest and open with people. I want to be legally compliant with my tenants and our prospective tenants. I don't want to lie to anybody, but I also find the situation where these people love lying to themselves about the damage that they do physical damage in rentals, economic damage in rentals, and somebody's got to pay those bills. When this girl's run $40,000, $40,000 in damage, that money is paid by some other guy that's a good tenant. And so I kind of see myself as this gatekeeper <laughs> in the world of housing, trying to make sure that I, the good tenants that I have don't get screwed. I've got this one nice little lady She's lived in the same rental since 1979. She doesn't actually, she, she doesn't really know how long she's been there, but I pulled her uh, file with Metropolitan Housing. She's lived in the same place since 79. I am her seventh landlord. And she said, I really hope you're my last landlord. And I said, why? And she said, because out of the last seven, five of them went bankrupt. I said, five of them went bankrupt. Yeah, she could, they couldn't figure out how to make money on this place. And I said, oh, yeah, I've got really bad odds. <laughs> that I will be your last landlord, but gosh darn it, I'm going to try. So I, I sit down and have this conversation with some of my, my bad tenants and stuff. I say, hey, have you met Miss Janet? She's my favorite tenant on the whole world in the whole world. She's 75 years old. She's lived in the same place since 79. I want to be Miss Janet's last landlord. And in order for me to be her last landlord, I have to have a profitable rental business. And in order to have a profitable re rental business, I have to have good tenants. And if I deny you, it's because I think you're a bad tenant. And you're going to cost me money. You're going to cost Miss Janet over here that's lived in the same place since 1979 some money too. And I am here as a landlord to protect her. And I, I try and have that conversation with as many people as I can. And some of my tenants um, get it and they understand. Some of my for, former tenants, bad applications, things like that, they just don't understand. But um, I, I wish and hope that one day they will. Special thanks to Brandon for coming on the show and just laying out that intense amount of education, right? You can't get an education like that anywhere else other than actually hearing it from a landlord himself who has dealt with that stuff. So if you guys want to hear more about Brandon's story in the show notes below, we've linked to his YouTube channel, Investment Joy. You guys definitely want to check him out. Man, that guy is pumping out a ton of quality content. If anybody else out there has uh, any types of... Uh, 
you know, tenant horror stories that they'd like to tell, I would love to have you on the show as well. So just post your stories in the comments below. And I want you guys out there to, to keep an eye out for the next video that we're going to do with Brandon from Investment Joy. We are going to do another interview with him about that tenant who had brought 13 witnesses to his eviction case. But for now, that's all I've got for you. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy. U.S. REIB is a full-service turnkey provider offering investors the opportunity to purchase single-family and multi-family investment properties in Cincinnati, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, and Kansas City, Missouri. The purchase process is seamless, from reserving a property to obtaining financing, inspections, and insurance referrals, U.S. REIB has a dedicated team in place to manage the process from start to finish. In addition, U.S. REIB is also directly integrated with its own private placement fund for accredited investors. The fund seeks to raise $10 million to capitalize on the repositioning of distressed single-family and multifamily. Cleveland, Ohio is widely considered to be one of the top rental markets in the entire United States. This is because here in Cleveland, our housing prices are low and our rental prices and demand are high. At Holton Wise, we provide the complete turnkey solution for all real estate investors, whether they are local, out of state, or even abroad. As real estate brokers, we will provide you with agent representation to help you buy properties ranging from single family homes to large apartment complexes. We even have referrals for lenders who can provide investment property loans to investors located in all 50 states allowing you to capitalize on the use of leverage or other people's money. We have referrals to top-notch title companies so you know that all of your transactions are safe and secure, with every single property being delivered to you with clear title. Once you close on the property, we have an investor-focused insurance brokerage who can handle all your property insurance needs. This insurance brokerage handles auto, home, life, and business policies, but they specialize in working with policies for landlords. We also have full service property management. We can handle all rental property advertisements, tenant placement, rent collection, evictions, maintenance, landscaping, construction, and repairs. In addition, Holton Wise also offers digital media and education. One day, when you are ready to sell your investment, Holton Wise, as the number one seller of investment properties in the greater Cleveland area, can market your property in a video, just like this one, to our worldwide base of investors who are looking to capitalize on the high cash flow opportunities in the Cleveland, Ohio market. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content, including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from hell. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.